Hey, everybody. Welcome to Healing in May Free with Janet Goings. This person, Michael Howell, that is on my podcast right now, he's from back in my old town, Narstown, PA. Good friend of my oldest brother, Michael. Welcome to Healing in May Free. Yeah, thank you for having me, Janet. Glad to be you here. You know, it, it, it's an honor to, to have you because I have not at this moment had anybody from Narstown, PA or from old school, you know, <laughs> on my podcast. So it's an honor. As you well know, my podcast is about healing in May Free. And I'm looking at all your accolades, you know, what you do as far as leadership, being a part of John Maxwell, you know, leadership team. You're in real estate, you know, brokerage. You have all these people under you. But without your past, your future might not be there. But I want to go into, you know, some of the things that you did in your past. I want to talk about that because then it'll segue into where you are at today. You went through alcohol or drugs or let's let's talk about that. Share with my audience just a little bit about your past. Yeah. So if it's OK, I, I have to start with, you know, childhood a little bit because um, I'm biracial and uh, my dad met my mom in Germany when he was in the service. And, um, you know, at the age of like seven years old, we went from, you know, what we call the hood out into uh, the suburbs where we were the first African-American family to live in Bettswood. And my brothers and I were the first African-American kids to attend the local Catholic school. Um, you know, but there, there's always challenges is having a biracial uh, relationship. My dad was a very, very popular guy. And by the time um, I was in eighth grade, my parents had separated. And, um, you know, pretty much my high school career went downhill and I, I ended up uh, dropping out of high school, which would have been my senior year. Um, I met my now today wife um, soon after that. And, um, we got married when I was 20 and uh, she was 22. And we had our first son, Michael, uh, when I was 21 years old. So I, before you go into where you're at today and your lovely wife, I, I want to take a step back because one, I didn't even know you were biracial. You know, I had no idea. So you just threw me a curveball. I, I don't want to skip by that because there's so many biracial you know, couples out there and you said it was hard for you. What do you mean by it was hard for you being biracial? Were you teased or did people make fun of you or you just felt like you didn't fit? Let's talk about that. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I wasn't really, I never felt included. Today, I understand that. But, you know, in the African-American community, I was light-skinned, pretty hair boy. You know what I mean? Mike, Mike Howe's dad. But then in the white neighborhood where we where we were where we moved to you know we were people of color and 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 we weren't included there either um and and that's why I, today I, I actually train at our local association on diversity equity and inclusion you know when you talk about not being included i get that leaving narstown pa even though you know both of my parents are black or were black, they're, they're both deceased. Me being a person that came from Narstown, PA, have a, you know, 95% white friends. You know, I come back to Narstown, people tell me, you know, you don't fit in no more. You talk like you're white and don't forget where you came from. And coming back to Narstown is hard for me because, you know, I switched over to being a Republican. I'm not ashamed of it because I don't need to be where my ancestors. I want to line myself with people that, um, are committed to or line closely to the word of God as I do being a pastor. So when you talk about not being able to fit in, did that cause you to want to look for a community that accepted you or did you get into drugs or alcohol? How did that play out for you? Yeah, after I dropped out of high school, you know, like I said, my dad being the, the influencer that he was in our life, my ideal of what a man was, was money, power, women. And um, as much as I had some, so much resentment towards my dad um, in my earlier life, I ended up doing a lot of the things that he did. 
Um, so one of the things was um, my dad never sold drugs, but my dad always had a lot of money. He was very, he was an entrepreneur. So he owned barbershops and worked hard and, and I admired that. And um, money became a big time uh, thing for me. So I, I always had a job, but I ended up selling drugs um, also as a side hustle. And so um, when I was 22 with a one-year-old, two-year-old son, um, one day in the afternoon, my house was raided by SWAT. And um, I remember, you know, just being in a, in a, in a kind of a, real panic place in my head because I love my family. I valued my son, my wife very much. And um, when they were raiding my house, I just remember my son walking into the room and um, he was in his pampers, right? And I just remember looking up and asking God, please don't let me lose my family. Mm -hmm. we, I had went to church a little bit when I was young in Catholic school, you have to learn about God, but I had not encountered God in the way I was about to. So, mm -hmm. You know, I, I was looking at three to six years in the state penitentiary and um, waiting, awaiting bail in a prison cell. And mm. uh, a, a friend of mine from the street that I knew happened to be in there, uh, his name is Scott Hill, and I'll never forget it. And he came up to me and, and he asked me, had I ever been saved? And I was just in such a broken place. He led me to Romans 10, 9, and I received Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And uh, the next day I was, I was bailed out, um, still awaiting trial, but I literally um, enrolled in the barber school that next day. And, you know, <laughs> soon after that, I met your brother, Jesse. You're a wise man because most people would know, Hey, I just got, you know, busted with drugs and I could be serving six to nine or maybe longer because of the color of your skin. Cause I know in our sound, I remember when cops would come by on uh, green and spruce and weigh these little bag and tell the black guys get off this corner. I'll throw you in jail for the rest of your life. So I know, you know, just living in our sound, you know, the crooked cops that they were back then, not all of them, but many of them were, but I remember getting busted in Minneapolis, St. Paul, <laughs> you know, I had just put myself in treatment in 1989. And some friends of mine wanted to leave their drugs at my house. And so me and my dumb self said, sure, just leave it in the closet. Well, they wind up a month or two later, got busted. And one of the girls said, hey, there's drugs at this girl's house named Janet. <laughs> so I get home late at night and my house was wrecked. I mean, they turned things upside down, everything out of cat. It looked like a junk pile. So I get when they raid, they raid. I mean, they, there's no jokes. So you found Jesus as your Lord, God, and Savior. You you went into barber school, which I think is amazing because most people don't realize that. Look, they want to see that you're willing to do something with your life or do something. Most people just sit around and do nothing and just wait, you know, for the judge to throw them in jail. So how did that impact? your next step as far as being incarcerated or not being incarcerated? <clears throat> yeah. So, um, you know, I was awaiting trial. Uh, this was in 1993. So in July of 1994 was my court date. And, um, at the time now it's been over almost a year and a half since the, since the arrest, I not only graduated from barber school, top of my class, I was working at Ken Do's barbershop. I was working at the Montgomery Hospital at, at night shift, and I was working at a salon washing hair. I got multiple letters. My dad, like I mentioned, was very influential. So that, that's another big part of why I, I do what I do today, right? That a lot of the guys that you talked about, the guys that we know that ended up going to jail and stayed in jail for a long, long period of time, you know, they didn't have a dad like mine. My dad had money, so I had a lawyer. Um, the courtroom was packed with my dad's friends and family the day I was getting sentenced. And my lawyer told me that day, he said, you know, you know that you're going to jail and you could be looking at three to six. We threw ourselves on the mercy of the court. My wife was pregnant with my second son, Marcus. And midway through the 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 uh, the the uh, trial, um, the judge actually stopped the uh, the and, and asked for the lawyers to go in the, and meet in the back because of the um, influence that was there, and and they made a deal, and um, I ended up getting fifteen to thirty six months 
in the county, immediate work release. And um, and I never had to go away from my family fully. So it was a, it was a really, really great day. Um, and for the next almost two years, because things had happened with parole, um, I ended up spending the next almost two and a half years up the county on work release, coming back and forth uh, while my, you know, my son, my wife was raising my sons. How did God play a part in once you asked Jesus into your heart, you know, it was like the light bulb goes on. How did that impact you as you were serving the time or doing, you know, the work that they asked you to do before you were finally free? Yeah, I, I, um, I started just digging into the Bible every day. And there was a pastor, Jesse and I talk about this all the time, Pastor Charles Stanley. I listen hmm. to Charles Stanley every morning at 830. And um, who has now passed away, has now passed away. But but he was very in, in influential in my walk over the next probably 10 years as mm -hmm. I, uh, you know, um, got to grow in my relationship with God. But also there was a lot of what I now know is post-traumatic stress and trauma of my childhood that I hadn't dealt with. So even though I never sold drugs from that day to this one, I started to pursue success and money just as much, just legally. And, you know, over the next course of 13 years, I became the number, probably the number one barber in, in Narstown in terms of, you know, money and influence. But along with that success, a lot of alcohol and still drug use was being done. So I was literally one foot in the church on Sunday. I never stopped going to church, but on, you know, Friday, Saturday, that, that was my time. And and um, and that eventually caught up to me as well. You know, I, I noticed that you talked about in, in the black community, many of us, which myself, I was raped, you know, by my mom's husband, Pat and Robert's father who is now deceased and was raped by an altar boy at uh, St. Augustine Church at that time. But we didn't have the finances to get counseling. So when you talk about trauma, um, which they do have today, EMDR, and that's for people who's been through a lot of trauma, which I'm still in counseling. I noticed that you didn't say you went to counseling because in the Black community, we don't go and get a lot of counseling. But it seems like to still medicate your pain and the things that you went through, you went to drugs or you went to alcohol, still looking for something to fill that emptiness in that void. Is that so? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, it started out, you know, casual, um, you know, weekends, get finished working at the shop, go right next door at the Wii. Right. Um, but sometimes when I was drinking, I would, I would make some really poor choices and uh, put my family in jeopardy again, um, drinking and driving, um, womanizing. And um, and I would just always wake up with like this worst, the worst guilt and shame that you could imagine. And so early on, probably in my, you know, mid twenties, I, I seek some therapy. Um, and I was pretty much in and out of therapy from the time I was, late twenties till today. I still mm -hmm. see a therapist, a Christian therapist today. But you I know what? I didn't get Go free. Ahead. I didn't get free from drugs and alcohol until 2016 when mm -hmm. I finally surrendered. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I get that because we have a tendency of holding on to something and afraid of letting go of that control. You know, I came out of homosexuality. I got off of drugs. I put myself in treatment in 1989, but I was a bulimic for many years. I was purging. A lot of people don't know that. Matter of fact, my family don't even know that. Jesse don't even know that. And just when my mom died three years ago, I knew it was time to get help because I've been bulimic for 30 years. I would eat and purge, but that was a sense of control because of the way I grew up. But just recently, about a year ago, I said it was time to get help. It was time to let go. So matter of fact, I saw an eating disorder therapist yesterday trying to get my life back on track and love the person that God created because we can still do that. I hid that from everybody. People used to wonder, man, how do you eat so much to stay skinny? But they didn't know that I was going to the bathroom and throwing it back up. You know, so I get 
what you said about, you know, not being free until 2016, but when you're ready, you will let go and you will be free as I'm learning today. So you went through all these things, you know, you, how many children do you have, Michael? I've got two sons, Michael two and sons. Marcus, two sons. And you're, and you're still married to your same wife? Same wife. She's Isn't that something? She's a, she, you, you, hey, you better years. say that. <laughs> You know, and I praise God for that because obviously your marriage, her marriage was so important that, you know, you didn't want other children. I don't know if you do have them born out of wedlock or, or divorce and your wife was that important to you and I can see your heart. But since then, the Lord has done some remarkable things in your life. So Michael Howell today is a business owner. Let's talk about what you do today. Who is Michael Howell today? Yeah, so today I'm a uh, man of God, first and foremost. I'm a husband of 33 years to my wife, Lori, and um, a father to Michael and Marcus. And I'm also now a grandfather to Liana Jordan, and I've got a little baby girl coming in April. Come on now. Let me say something about what you just said. Many people don't know order. God, you said your family, your wife, your kids, and then... The business comes after a lot of pastors don't even know that they put God first and then they put their business second and their family comes third. And then they wonder why their marriage is in jeopardy. Come on, Michael, you got that. That That is beautiful. Well said. Can, can we going. just drop, can we drop back one step to this? Cause something sure. happened in 2016 that I think is sure. very significant in my life. Um, after pursuing um, success, right? Like I, what my idea and what the world calls success for many, many years, I had become one of the top real estate agents for the company I worked at. I owned two barbershops and on the outside, everybody thought that, man, Mike, how was a successful guy, but drugs and alcohol were still dominating my life. And, um, and I had gotten to a point in February of 2016, after going through a a full year of a discipleship ministry called mm. Every Man a Warrior, helping men succeed in life. And in the wow. in the first book, it's about walking with God. Mm -hmm. And I learned not only I, I used to always read scripture. I remember I said I was I would listen to Charles Stanley and and read mm -hmm. scripture, but I wasn't I wasn't receiving the power that I was reading about in the Bible because I was still in bondage. And and through this year of having what we learn is a quiet time, spending time with God, meditating on his word, but allowing the voice of God through the Holy Spirit to convict enough to make me change. Um, and, and what happened was I, I was still successful on the outside, but with every success, financial, house, cars, vacations, it wasn't enough. It was, it was always left me empty. And um, after a, a real hard weekend of still drinking, feeling like a fraud, because I'm still going to church, but I'm still yeah. I got that one foot in at the speakeasy after Saturday, Saturday's cutting hair. And and I had had a, a pretty bad binge for three days. And um, and I and I was just in a broken place and I was in my in my prayer area and I just cried out to God to to help me and to take it away from me. And um, and I heard in that moment. God said, where I'm taking you, this can't go. And that was the last day that I took a drink. I, I went to an AA meeting and I and I did go to AA for probably about three, four months, maybe a year or two consistently, for about six months consistently. And then I found more um, fulfillment in my life groups at church. Um, AA works because when I, in 1989, I was working for Ford in Minnesota. I went to 90 days and 90, 90 meetings. I was so afraid that I would go back. I was like, a matter of fact, they had to literally kick me out of the hospital because I went to Fairview Southdale inpatient. I was scared to leave. And I thought, what am I going to do? So once I got on to a sponsor, I wasn't letting go. I was in, I turned over my paychecks to a friend. They gave me money. I had somebody control everything. That's how bad I wanted to be free. So when you want it bad enough, you'll go to every length to make sure that you get what you need so you can be free. That is remarkable. Amen. That is remarkable. So that happened in 2016. So let's talk about in the next, you know, five minutes that we have left, Michael Howe today. 
you're still married. Praise the Lord. You have two beautiful sons. You're about to become a, a grandfather and you have a business. I want to talk about the, the entrepreneur part, because a lot of times when you come from the hood, a lot of my friends that I thought would go on do well, wind up passing away, getting on drugs and, and not leaving there. Even when I extended a hand and said, hey, come to Minnesota. I got you. I'll put you in treatment. I'll help you. They didn't want to come. A lot of people don't know about that. I won't say the people's names that I reached out to, but I wanted to come back to Narstown, PA and bring some of the, the OGs back. You know, some of the people that went on to California, you know, uh, Warren Mitchell's brother, you know what I mean? Sandy. And I talked with them, talked about doing something at Elmwood Park. And I asked somebody to help me back in Narstown. They start out and then they drop me, you know, they wouldn't, they didn't want to finish. So I wanted to come back and get back to the community, but I know you're doing a lot for the community and with the community. Can you talk about that? Yeah. So John Maxwell has a quote. He says, once you taste significant, success will never satisfy. Come on. A year after I um, stopped drinking and shared my, my, with my pastor, my past, no one had known that I, dropped out of high school, no one known about the drugs. So um, I stood on the stage and shared that at a men's conference and I yeah. tasted significance for the, for the first time. And I recognized that everything that I had gone through was not just for me to go through it, but to help make a difference in other people's lives. So um, mm -hmm. in 2019, um, sorry, 2017, I had sold a hundred, which was a year later, right? Mm -hmm. I had my best real estate career ever. I, I sold 104 houses in one year. One of those mm -hmm. houses was um, listed by the regional director for Realty One Group, which was a franchise that no one had ever heard of in Pennsylvania. Long story short, I bought that franchise in 2019. And today we have three offices in Montgomery County, Collegeville, Bluebell, and Conshohocken. And we have over 135, 140 agents that work for us. My two sons, Michael and Marcus, run the sales team. I I do the coaching and training for the company. And my wife runs the administrative part of it. And I have a partner that manages the agents. And uh, we're the fastest growing real estate franchise in, in our area. And, and as far as the significance, right, um, through Maxwell, I have a coach. And one of the things he says, uh, Paul Martinelli, the content of your life becomes the curriculum of your evolution. In 2021, I established Kingdom Coaching that helps entrepreneurs, leaders um, to help them to become the best versions of themselves. And so that's my, what I call ministry right now. And it's taken my life's experience, um, failures, mistakes, successes, and sharing that with my sphere of influence, which happens to be, you know, our hometown of Norristown and, and the surrounding area. I'm a, I'm a board member of my church, Victory Church. I've been there for about 20 years now. And so I teach leadership and life groups there as well, as well as diversity, equity, inclusion at my real estate association, the Tri-County uh, Suburban Realtors Association. Wow. It, you know, it, it's remarkable what the Lord has done with you and with your life. And when you look back at all the things that you went through, it prepared you for such a time as this. Michael, we're coming to an end here. I want to give you the last words. What would you like to say to my audience out there? Um, it all starts with God. It all starts with God. I, I believe that uh, Psalm 37, 4, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. I've come to a place in my life where the desire of my heart is to do the will of God. And as I continue to surrender and walk out God's will for my life, um, he is elevating me and allowing me to make a difference and make a greater impact in, in the world. And that's what I, what I enjoy. That's what I'm most passionate about these days is to you know, use my life to advance God's kingdom. You know, and that's what God uses. Those of you that are listening, I'm talking to my good friend, Michael Howell from Narstown, Pennsylvania, where I grew up, 
where we both grew up and you know, it, it's like God took our mess and he made a message. Those of you that are listening and you have children out there that might be, you know, on drugs or on alcohol, you might be on drugs and alcohol. Just know that God isn't finished with you yet. Just the way God has used Michael and myself and, you know, took our past and, you know, turned it into, you know, something that is out there helping other people. He'll do it for you. He's no respecters of person. Michael, thank you for being on Healing in May Free with Janet Boynes. God bless you and look forward to seeing you when I get back to Narstown. Absolutely. Thank you for having me, Janet. God bless.